Uh, our mouse experiments show that if we just leave a mouse in a cage to its own devices and don't provide it any rehabilitation or anything like that, those mice just don't do very well. They don't recover. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 140 of the Strokecast. Today's episode is sponsored by the fine folks at Modus Nova. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of an affected limb after stroke, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. And by the fine folks at Like Minded. To find out if the Like Minded membership program is right for you, visit strokecast.com slash Like Minded. Today, we get a bit deep into the neuroscience behind neuroplasticity. Before we get into it, though, I I do have a bit of a content warning. We do talk about animal testing and experiments on mice. And while I'm sure the mice were treated ethically, they were in fact harmed in this process. I talk with Dr. William Zeiger from UCLA about neuroplasticity. The general thought process is that after a stroke, other nerves pick up the responsibilities of the dead brain cells, and that's how we regain function. But new research is indicating that that might not quite be true. An additional insight from this research is that it also reinforces what we already know about constraint-induced therapy, and it's always nice to have that additional validation. We also get into a discussion about the relationship between glutamate and GABA, which is fascinating in and of itself in how it regulates the activity of nerve cells. So we've got a packed 45-minute deep dive into the neuroscience of stroke recovery. Let's get to it and meet Dr. William Zeiger. So, Will, thanks for joining us on the, on the show this week. I'm glad we can make this happen. It's my pleasure. I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> now... Your research is actually sort of upending some of the some of the medical interpretations and some of the popular interpretations of, of what happens after stroke. So I guess let's let's start with the most at the most basic level in that, you know, sort of the, the, the way most folks understand how the brain recovers after stroke is that it's engaging in neuroplastic change. I mean, does your research Uh, support that idea or does it conflict with that idea? I think broadly speaking, uh, it does not conflict with that idea. I think that what it does do is tell us we need a little bit more refined understanding of what types of plasticity are capable, uh, particularly in the adult brain, after an injury like a stroke. You know, the more we we understand about the brain, the less we less we know what's going on in there. Exactly. Always more questions to pursue. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I mean, with all of these questions that are out there in this study that you did, I mean, why did you choose to address these particular questions? What was it about this line of research that we're going to talk about in just a moment that that uh, led you to pursue it? Well, we were really interested, like I was alluding to before, in having a more refined understanding of the types of changes that occur to neurons and circuits in the brain after a stroke. The sort of popular conception was that after a stroke, the brain would remap functions that were lost to the stroke to another part of the brain that was not injured or spared. And that was supported both by kind of some human and large-scale imaging data. For instance, if you take someone who's had a stroke and use, for instance, an MRI machine to look at how different parts of the brain activate, those patterns of activation are different in people who have had a stroke compared to people who have not had a stroke. And So that suggested there was some reorganization going on. And more broadly speaking, it was sort of an appealing hypothesis in the sense that we know that the brain can reorganize, for instance, during development, can reorganize very powerfully during development, uh, as well as in processes like learning and memory. 
And so we were hoping that we could sort of bridge some of the molecular studies that, that had been done looking at changes and molecules and gene expression that happen after stroke and these sort of larger macroscopic imaging studies and really look precisely at the function of individual neurons within the brain before and after stroke. The, the more Im impressive imaging technology we're getting and the, the closer detail is letting us take a much closer look at that stuff now too. And I think one of the things that's, that's important to, uh, you know, to just mention here, I mean, obviously we have the pop culture idea that, uh, we only use 15% of our brains. And of course, you know, we've known from neuroscience for, well, decades that that of course is certainly not true. It makes for some fun movies, but it's just not true. Exactly. <laughs> so how did your team then carry out this research what was how did you actually do this study to take a look at this question of are other nearby neurons re repurposing themselves or taking on different jobs yeah so uh, it's probably important to note here that we did this study in mice uh, so the tools for this type of study are not available in in humans right now um, but in mice there is a really powerful imaging technique known as two photon microscopy and this is a specialized type of microscopy and what it allows us to do is to actually image within the brain of a living animal the activity of dozens or hundreds of neurons all at once um, and so what we did is we took animals and we subjected them to a very precisely defined stroke and we did this in a part of the brain called the uh, somatosensory barrel cortex. Um, now, mice are a little bit different in humans in the sense that they get a lot of their sensory information from their whiskers. They don't have great vision. They are mostly nocturnal. So they get a lot of the information uh, that they derive about the world through touching things with their whiskers. And the whisker system has this really nice organization where every individual whisker maps precisely to one column of cells within the brain. And so what that allows us to do is to, for instance, choose a particular column and see how cells within that column of the brain encode information from a particular whisker. And then what we can do is we can cause a stroke precisely to that column and then image the activity of the neurons surrounding that column and see whether they sort of pick up the slack and start performing the functions that the uh, neurons that had been destroyed by the stroke were previously performing. So that's that's really interesting. There's lots of interesting things happening in there. First, I think what's what's really kind of kind of cool is that you have this separate imaging process that you can apply with mice that as as opposed to humans, which uh, again, makes an awful lot of sense because mice are just not going to behave in that MRI machine. It's it's it, it makes, you know, riding through that thing makes me want to scurry out for a hole in the wall. For sure. Um, <laughs> and you, you can actually do MRI on mice if you anesthetize them. But uh, the real advantage and power of the, the technique that we used is that with MRI, you could get a resolution down to about one millimeter, say. But a neuron is about a thousand times smaller than that. So you need to have a much greater magnification and resolution to actually see what's happening in an individual neuron. And that's what this two photon microscopy technique allows us to do. So by two photon, is that like get down to the width of, of that signal or because photons get even smaller is my understanding. Yeah. So uh, this is getting a bit into the, the weeds of the physics okay. of it all, but <laughs> generally, uh, when you do microscopy, you shine light on a sample, and then you're looking for either a reflection of that light or some emitted fluorescence in the case of fluorescence imaging, which we do in biological research a lot. And that's and, fine. And that, that fluorescence imaging, that's kind of what folks are most likely to be familiar with if they watch procedurals on TV where the, the, the investigators spray something on and see if remaining blood fluoresces. Yeah, that's a good analogy. And, and we can actually engineer that in cells or animals so that uh, 
certain proteins or molecules within a cell fluoresce when you shine particular wavelengths of light on them. Um, and so that works really well if you have a really thin sample like some cells in a dish. But a intact brain of an animal is much thicker and more complex. And so when you try to do that type of microscopy, everything just looks completely blurry because the light gets scattered all over the place. But it turns out if you use a very specific type of laser, and instead of exciting your fluorescent molecules with one wavelength of light, you do it with two wavelengths uh, that have to arrive at exactly the same time, then you can get much crisper, clearer images, um, and you can actually image deep within an intact brain, which otherwise wouldn't be possible. That's just super fascinating stuff. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I realize not everybody is nearly as interested in that as, as I am. I, I just think that stuff is really cool. But uh, to get back to the research then, I, I mean, as you started looking then at these different columns of nerves connected to that whisker and the neighboring whiskers, wh what exactly did, did that research show then? I mean, I think we're, we're assuming that that would mean that, you know, the nearby columns would take on some of the function of that. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's what we were expecting. So I'm going to give it a name just for ease of talking about, but we name the columns and whiskers on a mouse with a number and a letter. So for instance, in this study, we were looking at the C1 whisker. The, the particular name doesn't really matter so much, but just to make it easier to talk about, we were stimulating this C1 whisker and then looking at the column of cells that correspond to that C1 whisker. And if you look closely at individual neurons within the brain, you find that in this C1 column, uh, about 30 to 40% of those neurons will respond to that C1 whisker. And if you move to its neighbor, one column over, you'll find that many fewer cells respond to that C1 whisker, maybe about 10 or 15%. Uh, but there are some cells there that do respond to the C1 whisker, even though that's not its uh, corresponding column. And so what we expected, based on this hypothesis of remapping, that the function of the C1 whisker would remap to those adjacent columns, is that we would see more neurons in those adjacent columns start to respond to the C1 whisker after stroke. Uh, and again, that was what would be predicted by the hypotheses um, that were most prevalent in the field. And as you looked at that hypothesis, um, it didn't happen? Yeah, exactly. We, we were really surprised to find that if we look in those adjacent columns, the number of cells that were responding to that C1 whisker went down after stroke rather than up. And if we looked in a more detailed way at how reliable and robust the responses were in those cells, they also went down. So you had fewer cells responding to that C1 whisker, and the responses that were gener generated were less reliable and less robust after stroke. Interesting. So those surrounding nerves almost you know, decided they're not making decisions here, but right. they <laughs> were almost deciding, well, uh, it looks like there's no actual signals coming from there. It must just be garbage data and disregarding it. Yeah. I mean, it is certainly tempting to anthropomorphize it like that, but uh, you can certainly um, think about it that way in that we expected that those neurons would say, hey, let's pick up the slack and start taking over for those neurons that were lost. But instead, they just sort of tuned it out and said, we're not going to concern ourselves with that whisker anymore, which is obviously not what you would want if you were trying to recover function from that whisker. Right, right. So as you, these mice went on doing micey things in a lab, uh, did their brains ever start receiving signals from that whisker again through a different uh, different pathway or different mechanism? Well, what we found is if we just left the mice alone, the number of cells responding to that C1 whisker would sort of recover back to their baseline level, but they would never increase as we had expected 
But even once they had sort of recovered to that baseline level, their responses were still less reliable and less robust. And so we thought, well, what if we take a page from our um, colleagues in the rehabilitation world and we try to rehabilitate these animals somehow? And so we implemented something that we thought was similar to a type of rehab therapy called forced use therapy. Um, and so if you take, for instance, someone who's had a stroke and perhaps lost the ability to move their right hand, what a uh, rehab uh, therapist would do is say, okay, I'm going to actually take your good hand, your left hand, and put it in a soft cast or something so you can't use it. And now you're forced to use your right hand to do everything. Um, and we've known that that does help people cover function but we haven't really known why. Um, and so we kind of implemented that in our mice. And what we did is we actually trimmed off all of their whiskers, except for the one whisker that corresponded to the area of the stroke. And so now we forced these animals to derive all their sensory information through that one whisker that uh, had uh, corresponded to the part of the brain that had a stroke. And in doing that, you know, I think uh, that forced use therapy, or uh, we often refer to that as constraint induced therapy as well, mm -hmm. that then they did then start to do some recovery and start getting signals from that, that one whisker then. Yeah, what we found is that those neurons that were responding to that whisker started to respond much more robustly. Actually, they were responding even more reliably than in the state before they had the stroke. So. While we didn't see more cells taking on that function, the cells that were remaining and spared started to work harder in order to compensate for the loss of that uh, column of cells. Interesting. So those cells that then were working harder and responding more, they were not in the original C1 column that was damaged by the stroke. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and so... Uh, so were they then the ones in the neighboring columns that were sort of getting a little bit of signal or were they elsewhere in the brain? Yeah, so we restricted our, our imaging in this uh, paper to the, the areas uh, sur immediately surrounding the stroke as that area is thought to be the most likely to show this remapping phenomena. And so these were cells, like you said, that were in adjacent columns that did respond to that C1 whisker even before the stroke. But now after the stroke, once the animals had received this forced use therapy, those cells were responding even more robustly and reliably um, than they were before the stroke. Okay, so let me make sure I'm um, understanding this, this clearly then. So what happens is the C1 neurons disabled after the stroke, they're gone, they're dead, they're not, not coming back. Yep. Before the stroke, there were always uh, other neurons maybe in columns A1 and B1 or whatever we want to call them mm -hmm. that also received signals from that C1 whisker, but it was kind of just sort of noise. They weren't necessarily responding directly. After the, after the stroke then, the, those nerves stopped getting as much reliable signal and they started being disregarded. And then we engage in therapy and it's like those nerves start to come back and it's like, oh, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I do have valid data to contribute to this brain. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think that's a really good, succinct summary. So when we start then broadening or extrapolating this out to the human brain, uh, always a challenge, but, you mm -hmm. know, sort of the core of why we're we're actually doing this Um the the cells, for example, in my case, and obviously I'm not asking you to diagnose my stroke or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, you know, obviously, as of June 3rd, 2017, I lost the use of my left hand. Now I can actually use more fingers than I could a few years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, those cells, other cells in my brain that weren't as active, perhaps the ones dedicated to singing the Gilligan's Island theme song or whatever, haven't remapped to take on the function of 
uh, those 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 dead cells that previously controlled my 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 left fingers. But so so how is the brain then picked up and and started using those fingers again? Yeah. So I, I like your your Gilligan's Island cells. So <laughs> I think what that, our, I think that's like sixty percent of my brain. <laughs> I think uh, what our research suggests is is probably that those Gilligan Island cells are not like you said remapping and now controlling your fingers, but probably after your stroke, which affected part of your brain that controlled your hand, uh, some of those cells that were controlling your fingers even before stroke were were spared in the sense that not every single cell that was controlling your fingers was lost to the stroke. Then the stroke happened, and those cells that were con controlling the fingers but spared, they probably started responding less reliably and re less robustly. And there's some evidence from other groups, uh, like uh, Tom Carmichael, who's the chair of our department here, he's looked at this a lot, showing that after a stroke, there's an excess of inhibition, meaning that neurons get kind of silenced and shut down. And that's what we saw in our data too. Now, over time, and presumably after therapy, the number of those finger responsive cells that were still remaining started to come back online and work again, and maybe work even more robustly than they had been before your stroke uh, through the engagement of therapy. Well, and, and, and that's interesting because a, a lot of times when we talk about that, especially in the acute phase of recovery, you know, uh, right after the stroke, uh, you know, everything is just sort of shocked and the cells that aren't killed uh, in the penumbra, the mm -hmm. surrounding area around the, uh, the stroke are just kind of knocked offline. Mm -hmm. But those will typically come back within a few days or a few weeks of the stroke. So we're not talking about ones that maybe were just shocked in the penumbra and then uh, gradually came back as they sort of shook off what happened and, and began to wake up again. We're talking about ones that were damaged by the stroke and maybe still floating around in that, that scar tissue someplace a couple of years later are now being listened to by the brain a little more. Potentially. I mean, I think we do think that the penumbra is sort of a special place where you can have more of this type of plasticity, but we don't know the full extent of, you know, where these neurons are located that are coming back online. We are learning that functions like movement or sensation are much more broadly distributed in the brain than was initially appreciated. We often think about, well, this piece of the brain does that and this piece of the brain does this other thing. Uh, but probably these functions and calculations are more broadly distributed than we appreciate. And the other piece of evidence that I'll, that I'll put forward is that it's been known for a long time, well, maybe not a long time, but in the last 10 or 20 years, we've gained an appreciation that the greater the extent that the circuits and connections of the brain are preserved after a stroke, the better people recover. So there are probably some constraints on the amount that someone re can recover, which are imposed by the degree to which those normal pathways are preserved after a stroke. It sounds like basically the more physical damage that happens to the brain, the harder recovery is going to be. Exactly. And we see that uh, just with a simple correlation of how big the stroke is compared to how much uh, disability people have. The bigger the stroke, generally speaking, the more disability people end up with. And that then becomes part of the reason why when we look at things at the most basic level of, say, ischemic strokes versus hemorrhagic strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes uh, tend to call, have higher fatality rates and have much more severe disability. Obviously, every stroke is different, but generally they result in, in greater disability because while well, an ischemic stroke will starve a region based on a clot, once you have a bleed happening, you're, um, well, in addition to doing like the garden hose in the mud type of thing to the brain cells with blood coursing into the brain, you've got then big 
clots forming outside the blood vessels, putting pressure, crushing things and causing more physical tissue damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that goes a lot that goes into that calculation. Uh, In particular, with hemorrhagic strokes, you're adding volume into the brain. And so, like you said, when you add volume into the brain, you can then force blood vessels closed. And then that, that causes secondary ischemia. Uh, you also get a lot more, tend to get a lot more swelling related to, um, hemorrhagic strokes. And the mass effect of blood sitting in the brain can actually push the brain down and compress the brain stem. And, and that's where you tend to get a lot of the, um, mortality associated with hemorrhagic strokes. And, uh, and that's why one of the, one of the treatment protocols regarding hemorrhagic strokes is often the craniectomy where they'll remove part of the skull to actually give the brain a chance to have some space to swell into while it's going through all this trauma. Right. So what does you know, sort of this mouse research then indicate for the other popular phrase around uh, stroke recovery and really about understanding neuroplasticity overall, which is the the phrase uh, that nerves that fire together wire together. Yeah, so that's a phrase that has grown out of um, uh, plasticity research, um, and it comes from both what happens during development and in what happens in uh, sort of learning paradigms. And so you have nerves uh, which connect to each other. One nerve will send out an axon, uh, and that will connect with another nerve's dendrite, and they connect through a specific structure called a synapse. And so the brain is kind of constantly forming and unforming these synapses. And the way that you stabilize these synapses is for uh, a, a connection, a chemical connection. So when one brain cell fires, it sends out neurotransmitters that go to that other brain cell, and then that synapse or connection between those two cells is strengthened. So that's where that nerves that fire together, wire together comes from. I think what our, how our research fits into that is that it suggests there is probably some constraint on this process, and that may in part be structural. And so that goes back to this idea that the more that the physical structures the normal physical structures are preserved after a stroke, the better people tend to do from a disability and recovery standpoint. And so if you have preservation of these connections, even if those synapses are disrupted by the stroke, once those cells kind of start to come back online and through therapy or other manipulations become excitable and start to fire again, they can wire back up. But If those physical structures aren't preserved and those nerve cells can't talk to each other and can't fire together, they're not going to be able to rewire. And uh, and that's sort of one of those important things to keep in mind. And the best way to get them back to doing that again is, again, to go back and do that therapy and to force that use into that affected, affected function. Exactly. Yeah. And when we talk about the neurotransmitters, that actually go from one cell to another, from axon to dendrite, uh, just to tie it together. Those are some of the things that we talk about in other fields when we start talking about things like uh, like how SSRIs or antidepressants work, is that one thing they do is they just stop collecting extra neurotransmitters in the brain or other things to release things like dopamine or Mm -hmm. uh, these other chemicals we talk about in the brain. That's all about the stuff that carries signals from one nerve to another. Exactly. Yeah. So serotonin and dopamine are both neurotransmitters. When we think about uh, stroke and neuroplasticity, we often think about a neurotransmitter called glutamate, which is the most ex- uh, most common excitatory neurotransmitter. So when one cell releases glutamate onto another, it tends to excite that other cell. Um, and then the sort of counterpart to glutamate is GABA, uh, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. So if you release GABA onto another cell, you uh, tend to inhibit or suppress the firing of that other cell. And so one of the ways in development that plasticity is regulated is by 
regulating this balance between excitation and inhibition. Uh, and shifting that potentially towards more excitation could uh, be involved in promoting plasticity and formation of new connections. And so something that our lab is really interested in now is can we sort of manipulate this balance between excitation and inhibition to try to promote plasticity and improved rewiring, remapping, and recovery after stroke. That is some fascinating stuff. I've, I've, I've encountered a little bit in my, my reading about uh, glutamate and GABA, but definitely it's something I'm going to have to go ahead and learn, learn more about as part of this, part of this process. Uh, so as we look at what you've been doing so far in this research, I mean, what, what are sort of the, the next steps? What, what do you want to, what do you next want to do with these mice? Yeah, so the, and I'm assuming it's not going to be the exact same mice. Uh, they no. they've done their job. They've they've earned their mousy retirement, whatever that looks like. Yes, exactly. They've they've contributed admirably to our our scientific knowledge. Um, what we're really interested in doing now is understanding, like I was alluding to before, this balance between excitation and inhibition that occurs after stroke. So we know that immediately after a stroke when you have a bunch of neurons which have been destroyed by the stroke, they will leak out their neurotransmitters. And they tend to leak out a lot of glutamate. You could imagine that that could be problematic in the sense that if you have too much glutamate le leaking out everywhere in an unregulated manner, you could have over-excitation, and that can actually lead to more cells dying. Um, or in extreme cases, even seizures. So we do see seizures in a uh, number of patients immediately after they've had a stroke, and it may be related to this phenomena. So, so, so one of the things that's happening there then is you have a stroke that is traumatic for the brain. You've got cells dying. You've got cells sh shocked into their own consciousness. Maybe you have uh, blood leaking into the brain. So the brain is already in crisis and then these cells that are dying start just leaking extra glutamate in, which just mm -hmm. activates everything else. So you can imagine like, you know, maybe you're in a crisis situation at work. You're trying to just solve the problem. And all of a sudden you've got lots of other people in the area just coming at you and screaming and bringing lots more problems to you, which is now just causing even more problems. And it's just sort of cascading on itself. And that's what's happening that day of the stroke. Exactly. And so uh, this is a bit of speculation, but we do know that if you look in the days and weeks after stroke, what you see is a strong increase in, in these inhibitory pathways. And that is probably a response to all of this excitatory chaos that you try to tamp that down, protect those neurons that are spared, uh, and keep them from accumulating more damage. So in the acute phase, it makes sense why that would be a good thing to do. And and, and maybe I'm uh, stretching it too far then, but it, so so please let me know if I am. But that mm -hmm. that could explain why you know sort of that that initial day I'm in the hospital. I'm thinking, well, I'm going to be here for a while. I'm going to get so much reading done. And in fact, what happened over the next couple of weeks was I ended up just spending a lot of time sleeping, mm. which I would almost understand is maybe that's sort of those uh, after that initial crisis. Now you've got all of this other cleanup happening, all of this stuff to tamp down that activity, which could then, you know, that's sort of one could be one reason why we end up having to sleep so much in, in that response. Potentially. I mean, it's certainly a very energy consuming process. But uh so you could, I mean, you can imagine why that the brain might have evolved to increase inhibition to sort of protect what's left. But as you shift from this sort of acute phase right after the stroke to the subacute phase, where now we want to be uh, engaging plasticity and rewiring through therapy, uh, that excessive inhibition it becomes problematic, right? We said before that neurons that fire together wire together. So if you have a whole bunch of inhibition and neurons are not firing together, they're not going to wire together. 
And so we're trying to understand where this extra inhibition comes from, what's the cellular and circuit mechanism for that, and then to look and see if we manipulate this process, can we shift the balance towards more excitation and more plasticity. Fascinating. And that's going to be a great area to see what what we learn and, and what comes out of that. So, I mean, with what we know today now, with, with this initial research, I mean, what, what can survivors or OTs and PTs and rehab doctors and neurointerventionists and everybody, what, what can we do with this information uh, today that these mice have taught us? I think one thing that um, is really something we've already known, but this underscores is the importance of rehabilitation and physical therapy. Uh, our mouse experiments show that if we just leave a mouse in a cage to its own devices and don't provide it any rehabilitation or anything like that, those mice just don't do very well. They don't recover. That therapy is so important for maximizing what's left. And then I think the other Thing that our research points to is that we need to start coming up with ways to boost the system. Therapy is really good at maximizing what's left, but now we need additional interventions, which could be through neuromodulatory techniques or novel therapeutics that are going to help us shift that balance between excitation and inhibition in the right way and allow us to reopen those plasticity mechanisms and boost the amount of recovery that we can get just with therapy alone. And that's one of those keys then. Once we can start boosting that receptivity to therapy, we can start seeing a lot of other stuff. And I know a couple of weeks ago, uh, we I was just talking with uh, Dr. Jesse Dawson from the University of Glasgow, who's been doing some really interesting work with vagus nerve stimulation mm -hmm. and applying e, e stem to the vagus nerve to not actually treat it for stroke, but it uh, it's resulted in the brain, making the brain more receptive then to the physical therapy and occupational therapy uh, exercises that then get pursued. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, one of our UCLA physicians, Steve Kramer, was involved in some of that uh, vagus nerve stimulation research as well. It's amazing how all this stuff just sort of then comes together. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, obviously, I know, I know what certainly sparked my interest in neurology and neuroplasticity, and I now know way more about neurology and neuroplasticity than any marketing guy should ever know. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, what, what drove you to pursue this this career in stroke research and in neurology? Well, I, um, you know, I got interested in research when I was an undergraduate. And um, at the time, I was doing sort of biochemistry and biophysical experiments, which were, were really cool, but they were, they were sort of devoid of uh, uh, the larger context of health and disease, um, which is something I'd been interested in, in for a while. I had planned to go to medical school. Um, and then I got involved in research and I thought it was interesting. So I decided to do a career in as what we call a physician scientist. So I did medical school and a PhD. And during my PhD, the type of research that I was always drawn to was research on the brain and neurological disorders. And I think it's just because it's such a mystery. Still, there's so much that we don't understand. Uh, and that was really enticing to me. And there's a huge need as well, right? There are major lack of therapeutics for stroke and many other neurological disorders. So there's a huge need there. So my, my interests were in these neurological diseases and I kind of followed a molecules to circuits approach. So I did sort of cell <laughs> biology research. And then I thought, you know, what would be really cool is if we could look at the next step up, how these, these molecules start to influence the activity of neurons and circuits. Uh, and so when I came to UCLA for my neurology residency, I did a postdoctoral fellowship with um, Carlos Portera Cayu, who is one of the sort of pioneers in doing this specialized type of microscopy that I was describing to you earlier. Uh, and so now that I'm doing my own research, it's uh, I've been focusing on stroke in part because it's a, a very tractable problem. Uh, we have mouse models for it. 
there's a good amount of understanding about what goes on. And so it's, it's ripe for these kind of studies. Um, but I'm also um, interested in other neurological disorders, uh, for instance, Parkinson disease, which I see a lot of in my own personal clinic. Mm. And that, that's then, of course, also something that's, that's very interesting to see how all of these, uh, you know, I tend to think of it as our, uh, uh, as our neurological disorder cousins, uh, mm -hmm. the other folks in, in that space. Uh, I know I had one neuro, one neurologist, uh, say that stroke is the least sexy of the neurologic conditions when he <laughs> looked at, looked at the resources available in the MS gym, uh, versus the ones in the, in the stroke recovery center. But, um, you know, there's a lot we can learn from all of those folks. And I know when you took mention Parkinson's that, you know, that's something I certainly uh, look at a little bit more than I might otherwise, just because my stroke was basal ganglia uh, based. And that's mm -hmm. also the part of the brain uh, affected by Parkinson's. So there may be a little bit more overlap there. There's a, an old um, quote in neurology that you learn neurology one stroke at a time. Um, <laughs> and so that, you know, for every person that's had a stroke, I, I don't know if it would provide some comfort, but realize that every time a neurologist sees you, they're learning a little bit more about the brain and how that part of the brain works, um, because that is one of the ways that we tell what each part of the brain does is when we see someone who has a dysfunction in that part of the brain. As we're starting to see more and greater awareness in the general stroke community, the survivor community. Uh, and much greater discussions on social media. And you're seeing a lot more stroke survivors just come forward to tell their story. I think that is certainly uh, feeding a greater interest and understanding in the public about just what's going on. This isn't just something that happens to a great grandparent that is now in a nursing home. This is mm -hmm. something that happens around you. This is something that can happen to you. And this is something that can uh, be a part of your life. Yeah. And you need to recognize it because one of the best things you can do for yourself is to get timely treatment. Absolutely. Uh, be fast, balance eyes, face, arms, speech, time to call an ambulance. Exactly. I, I also think it's really interesting uh, how your path has progressed to from, from looking at sort of that molecular level. And then it's like, you know what? These molecules are a little too small. I want to deal with something bigger. So let's deal with individual nerve cells. I like to, I like to be able to see what I'm studying. There's something fascinating and beautiful about being able to take a brain that's, that's in an intact animal, put it under a microscope, turn on your microscope and see those brain cells firing. And, you know, that sort of uh, instant gratification is always appealing to me. Uh, yeah, to be actually able to uh, make observations based on what you see instead of just the numbers in a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm, exactly. And that brings us to our hack of the week after a word about our sponsor. Repetition. You see, that, of course, is the key word for stroke recovery. The Modus Nova solutions are designed to help you get the repetitions that you need to re-engage a stroke-affected limb. The Modus Hand and Modus Foot are robotic, AI-based, air-powered exoskeletons you wear while doing therapeutic exercises. Those exercises, of course, are based on video games you play on the included touchscreen display. They help you move your hand or foot as you play. And, of course, as you get better, they can also resist your movement to really help you get a good workout in. The key, though, is that the modus hand and modus foot help you get in the thousands of repetitions you need to build alternative pathways in the brain and get those limbs back. To learn more and see if modus nova is right for you, visit strokecast.com slash modus nova. Use promo code STROKECAST to get 10% off your first month. And now back to our hack of the week. It's not pretty, but it's useful. Um, and that is um, one of the ways that people with disabilities really get into trouble is falls. Um, and uh, a common time that people can have falls is at night in the dark. So if you have a disability and you have difficulty with walking or balance, uh, when you lose your, your visual input, 
and you're in your dark room at night and for instance you need to get up and go to the bathroom that's a time when people are going to be more likely to fall um and so what i recommend to a lot of my parkinson's patients especially folks who are a little bit on the older side and have to get up to use the bathroom a lot at night is to actually keep a uh, either a bedside com- commode or um a urinal for men uh right at the bedside and it's it's not pretty I, you know but it can save people from having to get up and go to the bathroom multiple times and running a risk of falling every time you do that. Um, so that's one um, thing that I like to recommend. So, Will, if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? Oh, sure. Uh, so you can check out our lab webpage, which is zygerlab.com. Um, and there you will can find out some more information about the uh, research that we're doing, some of the folks that are involved in this research in our lab um, and um, some of the papers that we've published recently. Fantastic. And we'll have those links over uh, in the show notes over at uh, strokecast.com. So, Will, this has been uh, fantastic. I mean, thank you so much for joining me this morning and and sharing this, this research with us. Lots of stuff for us to think about. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I hope your listeners enjoy it. Let's talk about our other sponsor for a moment, Like-Minded. Like-Minded is a membership program created by Jane Connolly, also known as Heal the Brain with Jane. Jane is an occupational therapist and podcaster who was already active in the digital stroke survivor community before she started the Like-Minded nonprofit organization. When you join Like-Minded, you get access to live online classes by stroke survivors and medical professionals. You can learn more about the therapies you engage in, the mindset around effective recovery, and really just how to deal with life after stroke. You also get a private text messaging group to get answers to even more of your questions. Get the support, accountability, and direction you crave and deserve for just $45 a month. Use promo code STROKECAST for 20% off your first month. There's been a lot of fascinating research coming out of UCLA or University of California, Los Angeles. A few months back, I talked with one of Dr. Zeiger's colleagues, Dr. Jason Hinman, about how COVID-19 causes stroke. And they did were able to ascertain that based on some fascinating studies they've done, including simulating the circulatory system that lives within the brain. You can hear that episode over at strokecast.com slash Jason. The impact of this mouse experiment on our understanding of neuroplasticity is why I wanted to talk with Dr. Zeiger. What I find really fascinating is the discussion around the neurotransmitters and brain chemicals. I mean, in stroke, we often don't talk about the details of the chemicals that leak from dying nerve cells or the excitation and inhibitive processes that the brain goes through in trauma and healing. It's helpful to understand just what our brains are going through during the attack that that is a stroke. In in general, we probably don't talk directly about neurotransmitters enough. I mean, these chemicals are are how messages get from one nerve to another. When we talk about nerves firing together, we're talking essentially about how one squirts a chemical at another. The more that happens, the more they grow together, which makes responses faster, and it means they can squirt less of the chemical and essentially spend less energy communicating back and forth. And I'm going to go ahead and put on my amateur psychopharmacology hat here and say that it affects not only the primary challenges with stroke, but mood as well. I mean, we've been talking a lot about depression the last few episodes, and one of the most popular class of antidepressant medications is the SSRI. Prozac, Lexapro, Paxil, Zoloft are are really just a few of the more popular ones. Now, SSRI itself stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. So what does that mean? Oh, let's break it down a little bit. You see, when one nerve cell squirts at another, that other one feels that chemical squirt and it responds. If there's not enough chemical, its response is more muted. Serotonin is one of those chemicals. When there's enough of it, nerves can respond. When there's not enough, they don't respond well. They, they just don't get the message. 
With all this chemical squirting, though, you would think that the brain would just end up completely filled with these chemicals. And it doesn't, because it has a cleanup process in place to clean up the used neurotransmitters. The SSRI medications work by inhibiting this process. Basically, it inhibits the reuptake of serotonin, which lets more serotonin sit in the brain and excite more cells. There, there's, uh, there's obviously more to it than that, but that's just sort of the, the real basics from an amateur uh, sort of uh, marketing guy here. These neurotransmitters, though, are also how the brain communicates within itself and with the nerves throughout the body that then communicate with the muscles. So while we talk about the damage to the nerves causing our stroke-related deficits, part of the reason is not just that the relevant nerves are dead, but that because they're dead, they are no longer fulfilling their role in the chain of communications. Because ultimately, what stroke is, is it's an issue with communication within the nervous system. Parts of the brain are no longer able to communicate properly with other parts of the brain or other parts of the body. And that's why this stuff matters, even if it is kind of nerdy. And speaking of nerdy, uh, this month I also joined Joe Borges of the NeuroNerds podcast on the NeuroNerds podcast. Joe appeared on uh, StrokeCast a few years back in episode 65, and you can hear that over at strokecast.com slash neuronerds. But on episode 162 of the NeuroNerds, uh, wow, it's impressive. Joe is up, up to episode 162 at this point. Uh, Joe and I talk about my stroke, about Doctor Who, about other nerd stuff, about COVID responses, about podcasting, about the brain injury community, and, and really so much more. So check it out at theneuronerds.com in your favorite podcast app. Or just check it out in the show notes for this episode over at strokecast.com slash mice. That is a lot of stuff for this week. Uh, visit strokecast.com slash mice for all the links from this episode. Be sure to share it with someone you know by giving them the link strokecast.com slash mice. Subscribe to the StrokeCast free monthly email newsletter at strokecast.com slash news. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.